Hey, good evening. Uh, if you would, go ahead and just take a minute and fill out one of the attendance cards located on the back of the pew in front of you. Pass those out to the ends of the aisle, uh, and those will be picked up later. Uh, if you would, please be standing for our opening song. Holy words of Be seated.
Have the opening prayer. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Dear God and our Father, we we come before you right now with with hearts full of thanksgiving. We we thank you for who you are. We we thank you for your for your goodness, for your loving kindness. We thank you for your grace and for your mercy and for your patience and long-suffering towards us. We, we thank you for loving us enough to, to offer your son as the, the sacrifice uh, for our sins. We, we thank you for his perfect life and for his perfect sacrifice. We, we thank you for his willingness to humble himself and to submit himself to your will. And I pray that each one of us likewise will humble ourselves and submit ourselves to your will. God, we, we thank you for allowing us to come together like this for the purpose of worshiping you. And I pray that our, our worship to you this evening will be pleasing in your sight, that we will worship you both in spirit and in truth. And God, I ask your blessings on, on Eddie this evening, that uh, as he speaks to us from your word, and I pray that each one of us will, will take your words to, to heart, that we will allow your words to, to guide us each and every day, that, that we may truly be be led by you. God, we, we thank you for the church. We thank you for the privilege that it is to be a part of your family, to be called your children. And God, I thank you for each Christian here this evening, and I pray that each one of us will be a, a source of strength and encouragement to, to one another, that, that we may truly enjoy fellowship with one another. And I ask your blessings on each one here this evening, that, that we may always you know, strive to be the, the kind of Christian that you want us to be. And I pray that we will will grow daily, that we will grow in, in wisdom and in knowledge and, and in faith and in maturity and in love and in compassion. And again, that we will strive to be the, the kind of Christian that you want us to be. I thank you again for your son and for the hope of salvation that, that we have through him and through his sacrifice and through his blood. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. When upon life's billows you are tempted, when you are discouraged in the moment is lost, how through many blessings in this world I won, and it will surprise you what the Lord hath done. How many blessings in this world I won, how many blessings in this world I won. 
after the singing of this song, uh, we'll have our scripture reading and sermon to follow. <coughs> be strong and courageous and do not be afraid. The Lord goes with you each and every day. He'll never forsake you. Do not be afraid. Don't be afraid. Go home with each and every day. He'll never forsake you. Our scripture text this evening is from the book of 2 uh, Peter in the New Testament, his second epistle, and we're begin, begin, we will begin reading in the first chapter, verse 19. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day that draws and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this first, that the prophecy of Scripture is of no prophecy of Scripture is of I'm sorry. The prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the word by the will of man, but by the men of God, spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. The uh, belt pack's giving me a red light, so I don't know that we've got good power there, so I'll, I'll try to stay close to this one. I didn't check that uh, <clears throat> beforehand. Glad you're here tonight. If you are visiting with us, uh, that, is a, uh, that goes double for you. We're especially glad when we have guests who come our way. And I know we had quite a few this morning uh, due to the holiday, no doubt. And if you are among that number tonight, please know how grateful we are that you've chosen to come and be with us for our worship assembly this afternoon. The Bible has long been the target of skeptics. And that's certainly no surprise, you, you expect that. If someone identifies as being uh, antagonistic uh, to Scripture, then you would expect them to, uh, to attack in some way the Word of God. But what is surprising, it's not surprising that skeptics would do that, but what is surprising is that some folks who identify themselves as believers in God and as believers in the Bible can be almost as quick to dismiss whole sections of Scripture as some skeptics do. And that's not only surprising, it's tragic. And some will dismiss the meanings of biblical words that are very easily defined and simply turn aside from them and, and deny their, their power by making statements similar to this. Well, the writers of Scripture were only human, and they were subject 
to making mistakes. And so we believe, some will say, that this particular section of Scripture, whatever one it is that they don't want to accept, we simply deny its validity. We deny that it's really from God. It was just the, the human expression of their own particular biased opinions. Well, is that the way that the writers of Scripture viewed their own writings? What does the Bible say about its own inspiration? This is one of our words that we're studying in our, in our One Word series this year, and we're trying to play catch up. I know we're a little bit behind in that due to traveling and some other things. But this is an important word as we think about God's word. And tonight I'm not as much concerned about proving the claims of Scripture. Uh, there will be time for that and, and no doubt we will at some point look at the evidence that backs up the claim. But before doing that, I think it's important for us to simply understand what the claims themselves are. What do the Bible writers claim about their own writings? Now again, we could go back later and say, all right, what, is, what, what evidence is there that substantiates the claims? And for that, um, or, you know, in that, in, in that line of, of study, we could spend a lot of time and a lot of valuable time for good things. But I want us to simply consider tonight what, what does the Bible claim for itself? Any writing that came from God, one would expect that writing to claim to be from God, right? Now again, the claim itself doesn't make it true, but you would at least expect as much. And the Bible, no doubt, certainly claims inspiration for itself. And I want us to consider what those claims are tonight. First of all, let's talk a little bit about the meaning of inspiration. When we talk about inspiration, what are we talking about? Some people, when they use that word, don't mean much more than just saying that a particular writing has the ability to move the emotions, to affect a person emotionally. And so someone may read from their, their favorite poet, for example, and come away saying, wow, that, that, that poem is inspired. And they, they simply mean by that that it has the ability to affect a person deeply and affect them emotionally. But when the Bible speaks of its own inspiration, it speaks of something far more than that. No doubt the Bible has a message that does move the emotions. That's true. But that's not what biblical writers meant when they talked about their writings being inspired. To say that the Bible is inspired in the biblical sense of that word is to say that the Bible is God's verbal communication to man. That the words that we have in Scripture are God's words delivered to us through human instrumentality. And so you'll hear sometimes reference made to verbal inspiration. And when we say verbal inspiration, we're saying that every word in those original autographs, the original documents, were words that were placed there due to the superintendence of the Holy Spirit. Okay, If I was going to describe or define biblical verbal inspiration, that's probably the way I would do it. It's to claim that every word penned by the original authors was a word penned under the superintendence, under the guidance of the Spirit of God. I believe that's what Peter was intending to convey in 2 Peter 1, verse 21, when he said, No prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. And so the original authors wrote exactly what God wanted them to write without error or mistake while at the same time being permitted to utilize their own styles, their own personalities. So 
When you hear me reference biblical inspiration, that's what I mean by that term. Now let's consider the affirmations of inspiration. Where do we find this concept, this idea in Scripture? Let me offer you a few uh, select texts. First of all, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 16. 2 Timothy 3, verse 16. Paul writes, All Scripture is given by the inspiration of God. All Scripture is inspired by God. Some translations read. Another reads, All Scripture is A hyphenated word, God breathed. And that really gets at the literal meaning of that term. So when we think about that statement, here is what the Bible is stating about itself. All scripture is God breathed. Let's unpackage that. Something in this text, 2 Timothy 3.16, is said... To be God-breathed. What is that? Well, the word is scripture. That's how it's translated into English. That word, translated scripture, is the Greek graphe. We still have a form of that word in English, graph. Right? And and, And we find that word graph in a lot of words. Like if I asked for David Mitchell's autograph. Okay? That comes from two Greek words. Auto, self and graph to write, and so self-write. So an autograph is where an individual writes his own name, all right? So that's where we get that. So graph, graphe in the Greek is a term that simply refers to that which is written. That which is written, graphe. Well, what's written? What do we write? We write words, don't we? So when the writer says, when Paul says that all scripture is given by inspiration of God, is God breathed, he's talking about that which is written. The words that we have are words that came literally from the breath of God. That's what scripture claims for itself. Now you see that again in other places worded differently, such as Exodus 17 verse 14. The Lord said to Moses, write this in a book. Exodus 17, 14. God said, those are words, Moses, write this in a book. Words. 2 Samuel 23, verse 2. The Spirit of the Lord spoke by me, and his word was on my tongue, David said. The word of the Spirit of God was on my tongue. So when I spoke it, I was speaking actually God's words. God said to Jeremiah the prophet, Jeremiah 1 verse 9, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. And in Luke 21 verse 14, Jesus told his apostles that as they went out spreading the gospel, they needed not to prepare beforehand how to answer their antagonists because they would be given at that hour the words that they were to use in response. And so those are just a handful of the affirmations of Scripture. Here is how Scripture describes its own inspiration. But there's one passage that I want for us to look at a little bit more closely. And that comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I invite your attention there, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. We're going to begin in verse number 9. If you go back, we'll start reading in 9, but if you go back to verse 6, Paul writes about the things that God had revealed to the apostles about his plan for the redemption of mankind. The the wisdom of God that they speak, uh, spoken in a mystery, verse number 7, hidden wisdom that God predestined before the ages to our glory. Okay, so he's talking about what God had foreordained before the creation 
regarding the redemption of man and how inspired men would reveal or had revealed, were in the process of revealing that message to others. And now pick it up in verse 9. Just as it is written, things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard and which have not entered the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. God's plan for the redemption of man was not something that we could have come up with on our own. We didn't have the capacity to, um, to devise that kind of plan like God did. Well, then how did we come to know it? How did we come to understand it? Look, beginning in verse 10. For to us, God revealed them through His Spirit. I believe the us there references the apostles and other inspired uh, individuals. For to us, God revealed them through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. So Paul in verse 9 references things, and that word things is going to be important because it comes up again in this section. He refers to certain things that God prepared for those who love him, things that reference our salvation and God's plan for it. Well, those things that God prepared, God revealed the information about those things to the apostles by means of the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Now, in verse 11, Paul explains how the Spirit knew those things in the mind of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, the thoughts of God... No one knows except the Spirit of God. Right? So he uses an example that we can all relate to. Nobody knows the mind of another person. Nobody knows the thoughts of another person except that person. You can't know what I'm thinking unless I verbalize that to you, unless I speak that to you, communicate that to you in some fashion. Well, in the same way, no one knows the things of God. No one knows the thoughts of God, the mind of God, except the Spirit of God. Verse 12. Now we, again, apostles, now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God. To what end? That we may know the things freely given to us by God. So Paul says we have been blessed with the Spirit, for the purpose of God revealing His will to us, the things from His mind that we could not know if God did not choose to reveal them to us. All right, and so we may know the things of God, verse 13, which things we also speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. So Paul explains how this happens. The Holy Spirit of God, knowing the thoughts and the mind of God, took those thoughts and communicated them to the apostles in words that he specifically chose. And Paul said, we then speak those words. Not by human wisdom, but we speak those things that we have been given by God through His Spirit. That's what the Bible claims for its own inspiration. So to come along later and say, well, they were just human. They, they had their own opinions and they're just throwing out their opinions that, are, that are, you know, were... Uh, developed by their culture and this, that, and the other. And so we don't have to take, we don't have to take what they say as, as being ironclad in any sense of the word. They were just human. Well, that's not the way they understood it. It's certainly not the way it's presented in Scripture. They spoke the mind of God in words that God Himself chose. Now, if the writers of Scripture were only human in the sense that it's trying to be, uh, you know, presented to us by, by the skeptic, 
and therefore, because they were only human, they were subject to mistake and subject to error. If that's true, then the Bible loses its authority completely. If, if we can't trust that this message is the message that God intended for us to have, then there's no reason to trust it. And that's ultimately what you're left with from skeptics both outside of you know, skeptics that, that, are, that are not believers and from skeptics who are. Practically, there's no difference. And notice how both Jesus and Paul <clears throat> use the scriptures in a way that shows that they, both Jesus and Paul specifically, believed in their verbal inspiration. That the words themselves were important. The words that had been revealed. The words that had been written. Two very quick examples. One from Jesus in Matthew 22 where he encounters a group of Sadducees who did not believe in the resurrection of the dead. It's part of their belief system. They just denied the reality of it. No, nobody has ever been raised from the dead or would be. So they encounter Jesus, Matthew 22, beginning in verse 23, and they, they think they have him trapped. So they, they present to him this hypothetical situation. Where they say, <clears throat> all right, so you have this, this man who was married. And to, to kind of condense it down, basically, here is, <clears throat> here is a woman who outlives seven husbands. According to Mosaic law, if, if, uh, if, a, man, if a married man died and did not leave um, a descendant to, to carry on the, the family then that man's brother was to take that woman as his wife and raise up descendants for his brother, the Leveret Law. So these Sadducees come to Jesus with this hypothetical, and they say, well, here is a woman who outlived seven husbands due to that law. And then they ask, now, in the resurrection, you can probably picture the snooty attitude that came with those words. Now, in the resurrection... Whose wife will she be of the seven? Because they all had her. You see? So they think they've got this figured out, that that, that that scenario is going to prove that there's really no such thing as the resurrection. There is no life after this existence. Well, the Lord's response to that was, well, you're in error. Uh, you, you are greatly in error because you know neither the scriptures nor do you understand the power of God. Then he explains. And part of his explanation involves... A quotation of Exodus 3, verse 14. And he asked them, Have you not read that which Moses wrote to you? When he said, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Have you not read that? And then he followed up the quotation by saying, God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And that was it. That's, that's what he said to them. Now, we have to figure out, what did he mean by that? And then when you look at it again, it, it comes to you. When God spoke those words to Moses in Exodus 3.14, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, as far as their physical existence was concerned, had long been dead. And yet when God spoke to Moses in Exodus 3, he didn't say, I was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He used a present tense verb, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. If that was true at the time God spoke those words to Moses in Exodus 3, what did that imply about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? They still existed. Now, they weren't there on the earth in physical form, but they still existed. Well, if they still existed, then what did that imply? Life beyond the grave. But that entire argument, which demolished the Sadducean position that there's no resurrection of the dead was all hinging, not just on one word, but on the tense of that word. The fact that it was a present tense verb. Jesus based his whole argument on that one tense of that one word. Did Jesus believe in the verbal inspiration of Scripture? Yes, he did. 
He believed that that word was inspired of God. And then an example from Paul in Galatians chapter 3, verse 16. Paul does a very similar thing. Paul is going to identify and connect Jesus with a promise that God made to Abraham centuries before. And Paul essentially quotes from Genesis 22, verse 18, where God said to Abraham, In your seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. And in Galatians 3.16, after referencing that passage, notice what Paul says. He says, and he did not say seeds as of many, but seed as of one. And that seed is Christ. So Paul makes a very similar argument when he says, look, when God specified seed, he was specifying singular, not plural. And that seed is Christ. Paul looked back to Genesis 22, 18, and he said, that word is inspired. And not just the word, the fact that it is singular and not plural is that way because that's the way God intended it. Did Paul believe in the verbal inspiration of Scripture? He did, just like Jesus did. One final question before we close, and it's a question that's often brought up. We won't have time to explore it in a lot of depth, but I think explore it sufficiently. And that's this question. Does translation destroy inspiration? In other words, the Bibles that we have have been translated from a source language to our language, a target language. We spent, if you were here during the summer um, or the last couple of months on Wednesday nights, we watched a series of videos that addressed some of that. I'm going to address it from a different perspective. But it's true that those who have copied and translated the text since the time of its original writing, were not guided by the same spiritual gift that guided the original authors. In other words, translators are not inspired of God like the apostles were. But that should not lead us to conclude that what we have before us is not the Word of God, just simply because it's been translated. And here's one example that I think helps us to see that. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, Paul said to Timothy that he had known the Holy Scriptures. Paul's words. You have from your childhood, you have known the Holy Scriptures which are able to make you wise unto salvation. All right, do you see that? Paul says, Timothy, from a babe... You've known the Holy Scriptures, and those Holy Scriptures that you've known are able to make you wise unto salvation. But those Holy Scriptures from which Timothy had studied were copies of the original manuscripts. Who knows how many copy generations removed from the original. Timothy was not reading the originals that Moses wrote. He was reading copies of them. And perhaps, with Timothy's background, perhaps he was reading them not even in the original Hebrew language, but in the Greek translation of them. And yet, even though copied and translated, Paul could still accurately refer to them as the Holy Scriptures. They had not been tainted in their nature just because they had been translated and copied. He still called them the Holy Scriptures. In addition to that, their original design of making one wise unto salvation had not been hampered by that process. Paul said, Timothy, the Holy Scriptures that you've known from your youth are able to make you wise unto salvation. He didn't need the original autographs in order for the Scriptures to still do for him what they were designed to do. So the nature of them hadn't changed and their design had not been hindered just because they had been copied and translated. 
So no, translation and copying does not in itself destroy inspiration. Here's the bottom line. There is no book like this book. None. It doesn't exist. Nothing comparable to this exists. And we are wise to recognize how blessed we are to have it. And so let us honor it for what it is. The word of Almighty God. The only verbal communication that we have from God himself. The only means of verbal guidance that we have in this life comes from this book. And so let's commit ourselves to its guidance, to its direction. And let us, as we said this morning, say no to any rival that would try to take us away from the message of that book. Holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. How blessed we are to live in a place where we have such great and easy access to it. Not every place in the world does. So let's not live beneath our privileges and let's spend time getting to know God better and more deeply by spending time reading, studying, thinking about, and living by the message that he communicated to us because he loves us so. Are you living that way? If you're letting someone or something else be your guide, let me encourage you to recognize that there's no future in that, not any future that you want to be a part of. Say no to self. Say no to anyone and everyone else when it comes to what the ultimate guide for your life is and say yes to God. If you're ready to do that tonight, not a Christian perhaps, and you're ready to be added to the body of Christ, you understand what you need to do, just let us know that that's your desire. We'll help you to obey the gospel. If you're already a Christian but not living like you know you should, change that today. And if we may pray with you and for you, would you let us know that that's your desire as we stand together and sing. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. Mercies ever come to an end. They are new and for me. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore I will hope in you. The steadfast love of the Lord. During the singing of this song, uh, if you were unable to partake of the Lord's Supper uh, this morning, it has been prepared for you. So if you'd make your way down to one of these front four pews uh, during the singing of this song, and you will be uh, served uh, communion.
If you would pray, pray with me. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross for us. Father, we recognize that it is only through the blood that he shed that we have hope of the remission of our sins. We pray, Father, that we will live every day of our lives in remembrance of that sacrifice. But now particularly, Father, as we partake of the Lord's Supper, we recognize this time we have to remember what he did for us and to consider ourselves whether we are worthy. We pray, Father, that we will always be mindful of these things. And we pray, Father, that we will partake in a way that pleases you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Holy Father, we continue this supper reflecting on the cup, Father, which symbolizes your son's blood that was shed on that cross. May each that partakes of it this evening reflect on, on the son and on the cross and on their own lives, Father, that they're, they're living according to your will for them. Father, may they take it in a manner that will be pleasing unto thee. In Jesus' name, amen. have opportunity to give back to God as he has blessed us. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the blessings that you have given to us. Father, as we sang earlier this evening, we have so many blessings to count, and we pray, Father, that we will be mindful of those, that we will, that we will live in a way that pleases you because you have given us so much, and we have no excuses not to. We pray, Father, that now we will give back to you in a way that pleases you from our hearts, not grudgingly, but we pray, Father, that we will do so cheerfully. We thank you, Father, for all the blessings you have given us. We pray, Father, that we will never forget them. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I know that the, the slide says Jesus keep me near the cross, but I uh, wanted to end tonight singing 106 out of the small supplement. So 106. Now, if you would please be standing for our closing song. <clears throat> yeah. How do you explain?
eternal God, our Heavenly Father, it's with pleasure and thanksgiving that we approach thy throne through Jesus Christ, our Savior, to tell you of our love from our hearts, as the song said. We ask thee, Holy Father, as we're dismissed at this time, that we'll continue to study thy word daily, to pray often, and to let you know our love for thee and our love for our brothers and sisters in Christ. Dismiss us now, strengthen us, guide us, forgive us, use us. Is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.